Welcome to episode 18 of Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast exploring sound and image cultures. I'm your host, Paula Blair. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Christy Smith, who treated me to an afternoon with the Spice Girls. We discussed their 1997 film Spice World, the movie, and issues around the industrial machines of popular cultural production. Thanks to listeners, pledgers, and to those who've been sharing us on social media. For now, enjoy the discussion. Today I find myself in lovely North Shields. <laughs> it's lush isn't it? <laughs> With a very special guest, Christy Smith. Hello Christy. Hi yeah. <laughs> Christy would you like to introduce yourself a wee bit or would you like me to because I'll say embarrassing things about you. <laughs> <laughs> Just make some sort of fine. <laughs> well Christy's a former student of mine from another life ago. <laughs> And is now a proper grown up. Oh no. Long before I'm a proper grown up. <laughs> but you might contest this today because of what we're about to watch together. Absolutely. We've met up because, well, we follow each other on Twitter and you've still got a great fandom around certain things and I'm really keen to explore that a little it's bit. Yeah, several yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> I like what I like, Paula. I like what I like. <laughs> That's all anybody can do. Today we're going to explore one of those things that you like very much and it's something that I have have not seen I know. before mm-hmm. but was very surrounded by this culture when I was a young small person <laughs> about 20 years ago. Would you like to tell the good people what we're about to watch? Absolutely, it's a classic. It's the Citizen Kane of its day. Exactly, it's, a, <laughs> it's an intellectual masterclass. <laughs> it's Spice Girls the movie or Spice World the movie depending yeah. on which country you're in. Yeah, it came out in 1998 I think. Why are you into this film what do you think it is about it that because I'm, I'm coming in totally clean mm-hmm. I know my experiences from I mean I got swept up in the Spice Girls a little bit when the first time I remember I think it must have been about 11 or 12 and Wannabe just mm. changed everything <laughs> there was this cultural explosion happened around these five girls and loads of my classmates were huge into them I got a bit bored after a while because I wasn't really that into pop music it was more into rock music and stuff but when you hear some of the songs even now you can't really help getting swept up in yeah. it again you know <laughs> so I come in from a very open-minded place so when I ask why are you into this I'm not interrogating you it's like a very gen- <laughs> what's genuine- wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> it's a very genuine question yeah, no, so fair. what's your experience because you're much younger than me and what's your experience of coming to all of this when I think about films I like I always go back to things I watched when I was younger Mm -hmm. because they're things I could watch over and over again Mm -hmm. and we were talking the other day about how you would have your TV VHS combo Mm -hmm. and you would just sort of watch the same things over and over Mm -hmm. yeah it's what you do when you're a bairn really so yeah the Spice Girls film I'd watch over and over again and when I went back to it as an adult I went oh actually I think there's something in this Mm -hmm. (laughs) especially if you're thinking about film theory and how it's all about the director and how usually it's a he usually he's in control Mm -hmm. of everything because Spice Girls were a cultural product before this yes they're very expensive Mm -hmm. they come with a lot of star power so it's just really interesting to see how that sort of disrupts the idea of film and how it shows up in the film itself yeah i think there's a lot to be said about celebrity and social mobility in finding your celebrity in that because these girls came from nothing and built this up through the group and then had this smash hit movie with loads of cameos mm-hmm. and stuff and I can't even remember who all was in it. I know Richard E. Grant's in it but other than that I can't It's a big recall. old list. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's a huge list so I think that'll be something to get into after we've seen it. I just thought it'd be nice to set up a bit of context <laughs> before. The band was so huge when I was a kid. Actually, I've been thinking about the Spice Girls game recently. You mentioned when we were on our way here about the 20th anniversary of this film yeah. has just passed and there was a little bit of buzz about that. And I was thinking about them recently because back in October, I went to a gig by a comedian called Sophie Hagen. Oh yeah, she's Scandinavian, isn't she? But she's Norway Danish. Yeah. When she was young, she was really obsessed with Westlife yeah. and won a big competition to go and meet them in London when she was 13. <laughs> and even at 13, had a impeccable English <laughs> and met the lads and she's always loved them. I went to one of her gigs and she was actually playing Spice Girls songs <laughs> in the sort of warm up when everybody's taking their seats 
and waiting for Get it to come out. Yeah. I just thought this is a brilliant use of this music because yeah. it was and it was mostly women in the crowd and she's a staunch feminist and she's also been so outspoken. You know, she's had whole comedy shows about her love of Westlife mm. and the fan fiction she used to write about <laughs> the band. And so I've actually been thinking about this stuff. I went to an all girls high school. There were girls in my class who were obsessed with Westlife mm. and there were other girls, not the same girls, but other girls in my class obsessed with the Spice Girls. <laughs> and looking back now as somebody in her heading towards mid thirties and looking back on that time and that aspect of and also Andrew and I have been sort of prodding a little bit at well probably mostly me really because what can he say about it but a <laughs> <laughs> girl who yeah. he can nod along. <laughs> he can he can nod, he can <laughs> imagine. But actually bringing him up because he's a bit older than us again and he was a student when the Spice Girls got big and he told me I mean because actually we should be doing this with him because he knows more about them than I do because he was a massive fan <laughs> yeah and uh, so it's his back tattoo secretly the Spice Girls <laughs> is it like a Mount Rushmore it's, but... a, it's a map of everywhere they've been <laughs> and performed it's not human migration at all it's Spice Girl migration <laughs> yeah yeah, he said like it was a big thing and all the student unions were playing Spice Girls all nice. the time and having <laughs> themed club nights and stuff and he was really into clubbing and things. So it was a really fun, I suppose kind of kitschy thing, but it was current and it was this cultural explosion, it was about female independence and all that kind of stuff. So he got really into it. He actually said he, he remembers going to see the film in the cinema mm-hmm. and then he had a VHS copy and he said he wore it out. He watched <laughs> it all the time, he loved it. And then they'd sort of forgotten about it and stuff. Girl fandom, I think, is something to prod at a little bit here as well. Because the thing, it's nice to take that sort of thing more seriously. Yeah. And then we can maybe think a wee bit about the Beatles and mm. Beatlemania and stuff. Because that was mostly teenage girls as well. Yeah, exactly. And if you think of like Elvis as well, mm-hmm. when he made those fairly shitty films mm-hmm. near the sort of end of his career when he came back from Vietnam, I want to say. He was drafted, so it would have to be Korea or Vietnam. It was one of those. A slight interjection here. I've since read up on this and Elvis Presley was drafted in 1958 and served two years in West Germany. But yeah, certainly um, pop stars like Spice Girls, Beatles, Elvis, they've all sort of had film careers. Mm -hmm. And it is usually female fans that power that. Just sort of thinking about it now, I can't think of somebody who's more aimed towards boys or towards men who's Mm -hmm. really had that sort of crossover career. Maybe we'll think of one during the film and that point will be completely mute. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all good stuff to set us up. Coming in fully open minded to this album. Lush. What did you think? I really enjoyed that. Yay! <laughs> I had a great time. That was class. <laughs> It was really funny. I was sort of prepared for it to be so bad it would be funny. Mm. And it was a bit like that at the start, but then I thought the comedy really picked up. And yeah, some, some of, of the, the jokes still play, yeah. Yeah, really tight comedy writing, and any film is only as good as its script. So mm. I thought it worked really well. <laughs> it's brilliant, really good fun. I thought the songs were incorporated really well. Mm. There was just a glorious camp and queerness to the whole thing yeah yeah as I well. think you see that the most I think when they're in that nightclub it's very much like if you've ever watched mm-hmm. Queer as Folk or if you've looked at anything you do with yeah. like club kids in the 90s was a big thing and you like literally see that in that scene you can see why people still watch it absolutely <laughs> yeah definitely really celebratory of just expressing yourself in the most flamboyant of ways that was brilliant it's hard to keep up with the cameos <laughs> in it. we should have made it a drinking game to be fair maybe uh, but then in the era of professionalism, <laughs> we were fueled on cake <laughs> instead. I really liked that it went a bit metafiction at, at the, the end. end yeah. When um, you know, because all the way through, it's punctuated with a lot of things. There's a lot to get through actually. But there's one of the sub stories is these movie producers yes. wanting to make this film, and they keep pitching these ideas that are really outlandish. Yeah. And we see all these really funny inserts mm. that are like Charlie's Angels riffs and, yeah. and stuff like that. It references a lot of genres. Yeah. But yeah, right at the end, he's actually describing what's actually happening in the film that yeah, we're seeing. And it happens. it's really very funny. It's, <laughs> it's done really well, I thought. So yeah, it makes a lot of references to a lot of different genres within film, but it makes a reference to a lot of different kinds of media as yeah. well. So you've got the main baddie is Kevin McMaxford. Yes. He's the editor. The sort of Max Clifford-esque, yeah. <laughs> um, making the headlines, mm. kind of. 
Well, I suppose Max Kerr was a publicist, wasn't it? And then him mixed with Robert Murdoch or something. Yeah, sometimes in between the two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Played, of course, by Barry Humphrey. You <laughs> know, <laughs> doing a very different kind of thing. Because I was a different thinking, kind of drag. Absolutely, because I was thinking there's a lot of drag in the film even if it's the girls when the girls dress up as each other yeah, it's yeah. quite like drag and drag balls and that kind of thing so I was thinking it's a sort of inverse of what he's usually mm-hmm. doing and yeah very different drag for him don't let me uh, <laughs> dominate I defer to you because you know more about all this and you, you've got more intricate knowledge I really enjoyed watching good it. I'm glad you enjoyed it yeah <laughs> I think at first I thought it was a bit like a ropey made for TV movie. I can see that. I think the director mostly did TV before this. Yes. I think they had the option to have a lot of big names, yeah. like people who are sort of up and coming, uh-huh. and they went for somebody who would direct like Ab Fab mm-hmm. and Faulty Towers, yeah. things like that. They were known for TV. Mm-hmm. This is Bob Spears. Yeah. yeah. So it felt very like that at first, and it felt like that it was a bit clunky and there were a lot of gaps, but it speeds up, it gets mm-hmm. tight. By the end, the laughs are coming thick and the time and it's exquisite the camera work rather than being obvious mm-hmm. becomes really funny yeah. I think there's some really good acting mm-hmm. on the part of all of the Spice Girls and Victoria Adams mm-hmm. as she was then yeah. back of now it was really game and a lot of time I mean Roger Moore was sublime <laughs> oh there's just so many lists I mean there was a really nice moment with Bob Hoskins it's very short yeah. but very funny and those are two guys we all miss a lot I bet it was Jennifer Saunders she's quite nice <laughs> She's blagging her way through knowing about fashion. <laughs> yes. Jerry Halliwell keeps giving them these little nuggets of information mm. that she's picked up because she reads. <laughs> <laughs> does um, she read, though? Does she? Does she read? Because the first scene you see her reading, she's reading The Sun. And then when they have that big fight with Clifford, they all go home at their respective houses. Uh-huh. She is a bookcase full of books. <laughs> but the spines aren't anything you would recognise. They're just lime yeah. green and pink. So I don't know if you've, you know, like in The Great Gatsby, where it's like, you need to cut the books open and they're all closed. <laughs> Right. I feel like the film wants you to sort of judge Jerry a little bit. Because she keeps coming up with these facts yeah. that are really vague. Yeah. You know, she went off on one about manta rays yeah. and then Victoria thinks, oh, I'll have a go at trying to sound smart and not <laughs> obsessed with fashion. Do you know anything about manta rays? <laughs> oh, I'm wearing a pair right now. <laughs> and Jennifer Saunders is channeling Eddie, isn't it, from yeah. Absolutely Fabulous, uh, for anybody who doesn't know that show. I love Alan Cumming. I was just trying to get up the name of his character because it's it's a double barreled name. He's playing this posh English documentarian. Yeah, Piers Cuthbertson and Smythe. <laughs> <laughs> they do a really lovely credit sequence where he's as himself going, I suppose I can do the posh English accent, yeah. but I have to wear this chest wig. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved his voice in it because years ago he did a voice in an adult cartoon called God, the Devil and Bob, and he played the devil and that was the voice he used <laughs> so it was really making me think of that to see a comeback yeah it was cancelled after one series yeah. and they never made I think 13 episodes of it but I thought of Fab and I love him and I love mm. him in it so it was <laughs> really cool yeah I like him because obviously with the documentary style of things He's just sort of blagging his way through it. Like, nothing he says makes any sense. Yes. But, like, can we get a wide angle on this? <laughs> or he's left to Richard E. Grant to sort of hang himself on screen. He's like, that is the perfect ending for this <laughs> film. He's talking about how the girls can't make connections and he's going to ask them a really, like, emotional question uh-huh. about what it's like to live in this spice phenomena. And then it's just, do you have time for boys? He's blagging his way through. He's not doing any of the hard work. He's got those uh-huh. two guys with him. Yeah, so it makes a mockery of a lot of things. There's quite a lot of commentary about the industry, the machine of stardom, the machine of celebrity, and that it's not about the singing and it's not about the fans. Issues around loyalty and friendship and how do you keep up with your non-famous friends mm-hmm. when you've become suddenly this big star. You've come mm-hmm. from nothing and you've become a big star. So they have a little narrative with their friend Nicola, who's heavily pregnant somebody at the party is just trying to get into the circle yeah and is asking her are you part of this world she's all oh, I'm nobody mm-hmm. when she's actually the character is like best friends with the five yeah of them. she's been with them since the beginning because mm-hmm. you see her in the flashbacks mm-hmm. but when you see them in present day they're always separated so it'll be like Spice Girls are on the balcony and they've got their backs to where she is uh-huh. and they're being photographed and she's just by the craft services table eating grapes and being hit on by very creepy men yeah well nine months pregnant and then when they decide to take a nine month pregnant woman to a nightclub mm-hmm. she's sort of on the balcony watching them How dance and enjoy them. themselves dance to their own music as mm-hmm. well and singing along to their own lyrics yes 
I mean, obviously it's contrived, but it serves a purpose. Yeah. It gives them that talking point around friendship and loyalty and being normal and trying to remember their roots as working class girls, yeah. as being poor. I remember reading interviews with them years ago and they were saying that for years when they were trying to make it, they were just living off beans on toast. They would have maybe one or two meals a day and they were starving and putting everything they had into trying to make it and then it became this explosion. There's a lot of sad foreshadowing of what <laughs> will come for them in real life with talk about the band splitting up yeah. and who's going to have babies. And <laughs> <laughs> what is it that you'll be on M Chachos talking about how you used to be famous? Mm, I think generally they've kept out of, some of them have kept out of a lot of that. Emma, wasn't she the one who did Strictly Come Dancing? There's loads of talk about their the first live television performance and that's there's not one bit of any of it that's live. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Everything's ADR. Like they're either always mime to their own songs and almost all their dialogues ADR. It's quite obviously it's not quite matching their lips. Not that that's an issue, but it's just something to point out. <laughs> I can't even think if they knew anybody who went to see them live. I wish I had, but I haven't. Well, they were probably well disbanded by the time <laughs> they were old enough to go. <laughs> so the film was made in 97. It was probably on general release mostly in 98. Yeah, okay. So I would have been about 13 and you would have been... A wee tiny baby. I know, yeah. Um, <laughs> about four or five. About yeah. four or five. How did this come into your life? I know, I when I looked it up to find out when it was made, I yeah. was like, what? Like, I remember it being a big thing when I'm old enough to remember it. Uh-huh. Like, at least nine or ten. Right. What does it say here, though? It was wrapped and edited within 12 months. Mm. So it was quite a quick thing they did before the second album. So it was like, first album, make mm. a film, which goes with mm. the second album. Mm. The VHS has always been there, but I don't okay. know how I came across it. And I've done quite well to avoid it until <laughs> I suppose it never came, I suppose it never went out of my way. I wasn't interested enough to, but I, it has shown me how funny it was. Mm. So do you think it's aged well for it being 20, maybe 21 years old now? I think so. And there's such a trend now for the musicals, the West End musicals, like Mamma Mia, yeah. We Will Rock You, Sunshine on Lace, the Proclaimers mm-hmm. one. There's such a mood for the live show of a film like that there's probably others there was something in particular i was thinking about it's more similar to spice world than some of those because those are written around the songs mm-hmm. but with the actual bands a hard day's night has beatles songs in it yeah and it harks back certainly to beatlemania and all the paraphernalia around them and that of course really fed off the britishness the yeah. englishness of this group I think the Beatles were all Liverpudlian, weren't they? With the Spice Girls, you've got a really nice tension between the Northerners and the Southerners. <laughs> Mel B is from Leeds, yeah. Mel C is from Liverpool. The others seem to be from the South. When they do that interview with Jonathan Ross, they're all speaking different languages, sort of yeah. talking to their fans. Mel's B and C say something about the Northerners, and Jonathan Ross is like, I've just got no idea what you just no said. No. You said. Oh, I'd, I'd love to meet Loaf <laughs> as the driver. And you were waiting for it. There were loads of just top class puns. Mm-hmm. I am a sucker for puns. <laughs> I have to say, I love a good pun. A good pun done well is very pleasing to me. <laughs> and they got a few in there with That's some me. of their stars. I really liked his. <laughs> there was this big build up to the toilets and the bus <laughs> being blocked. And he's the driver and Richard E. Grant as the manager saying, can you not just fix it? I will do anything for those girls. But I won't do that. But I won't do that. <laughs> oh yes, and Roger Moore, I never stir anything. Yeah. <laughs> do you want me to stir the pigeons up? And he says, no, no stirring. No stirring. <laughs> Leave the pigeons alone. Oh, I hear died of cute when he was feeding the pig. <laughs> With the ball. Yeah. <laughs> Every time you see him, ne- well, nearly every time you see him, he's got, he's this sort of overlord boss, yeah. isn't he? Mm-hmm. He's like the producer, the oh. owner of the management company. He starts off with a cat, which is obviously a reference to like bad guys in James Bond. The Bond villains. And then um, it becomes a white bunny rabbit. And then a teacup pig. <laughs> yes. 
And then the second time with the piggies feeding it with a bottle. Yeah. That's so cute. <laughs> and that you've kind of got the girls. I'll, I'll refer to because they're all, of course, women, but they're the Spice Girls. Yeah. So I think it's fair to refer to them as girls in this context. Their willfulness and their self-determination is pitted against all of these men yes. controlling them. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot going on there too. It seems like some of them are more supernatural in the power they have. Mm-hmm. So if we take Roger Moore, for example, there's a point where Clifford's talking about and he says, I'm going to call him and I'm going to say that the girls need the morning off. And the phone rings and he picks it up and he says, they can't have the morning off. Like, mm-hmm. he's preempted that. He's almost mm-hmm. psychic in his knowledge of yeah. what's going on. And as in, he always talks in metaphors that are always animal-based <laughs> as well. It's actually quite poetic. <laughs> like one riddles. Them, yeah, it is. Like, one of them is just that uh, he just answers the phone and goes, the headless chicken never gets anywhere. Or something <laughs> like that. And that's a constant joke as well that mm. Clifford Richard e. Grant's character always takes it seriously so he's like chicken I need to find a chicken something to do with the chicken <laughs> Kevin McMaxford so that's um, Barry Humphrey's character the, uh-huh. the dodgy editor it's a great melodramatic scene where they're in his office yeah. he's getting really excited about bringing the Spice Girls down you can see like spit coming from his mouth mm. and then there's a cut to the guy he's talking to and then there's a cut back to him I think that's purely because they need him to take more water so he can spit more out mm. it's just so melodramatic <laughs> and then it gets to the point where there's thunder and lightning and it starts topically yeah. raining in the office yeah over that guy yeah yeah it's nice because you feel like it takes you a wee while because when it first starts happening it feels very heavy handed but then when you're settled in and you're like this is a completely camp tone and this has come off the back as well I'm just thinking of the timeline maybe it's a bit before actually but the Austin Powers films because I was thinking there's a similar level of yeah, just tongue and cheek, the top kind and, of British. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. It tips over into that, and because that's the world of the film, mm. it makes sense and it's okay. And you are sort of settled into mm. the outlandishness yeah. of it, the obviousness of the metaphors, mm. the dramatic ironies, and the symbolism and everything. <laughs> because I didn't feel because sometimes I think there are movies that do it and it's talking down to their audience, but I felt that this was speaking to an audience who'll actually get it and Mm -hmm. get what they're doing and get the ironies that are happening Mm -hmm. so it can work on both levels. It sort of takes you in it doesn't really spell things out like there was a point where you'd ask well why aren't the toilets on the bus? (laughs) I was Mm -hmm. like oh there was a voiceover about five minutes ago which (laughs) fleetingly said this. (laughs) Clearly you've not seen this film seven times and caught the reference. I heard that thing about the showers but I thought how's that going to affect the toilets but then it transpires the toilets are broken and the bus of course is like the TARDIS it's it's so much bigger on the inside thing inside but you just roll with it you're you just do. like okay <laughs> the film set this up and I'm gonna go with it and wouldn't you want to live in that bus even temporarily be great. I'd love to visit that bus <laughs> it's somewhere in the Isle of Wight I think they've got it on display really mm. is it I'll have to go there that gives me a reason to go now <laughs> Not that I didn't have a reason before. <laughs> so the whole, the patriarchy's in charge yeah. and that tied in with that machine of, it's not just the music industry because it's the star machine as well. Mm-hmm. I think it's all embroiled in the same thing and there's all these things in tension because then you've got Jules Holland is in there pretending to be enjoying himself <laughs> as the director of the live show they're going yeah. to do in the Albert Hall. His thing is getting all the music mm-hmm. and they're singing right. So no matter what it is, there are these men controlling them and they're fighting against it and they end up saying, screw you Clifford, we're off. Us being friends is more important than working ourselves to death yeah. for this. And then they go off with Nicola and she goes into labour. And she has a girl baby as well. Has a girl baby that looks quite old. <laughs> and It's a girl toddler. <laughs> not at all Asian. No, not like at all. mother. <laughs> but the baby's old enough. The baby's well enough as well mm-hmm. and watch the show. Yes. <laughs> They're wheeled over. <laughs> yeah. With a midwife who's nothing better to do. <laughs> I thought some of the in- Inserts were really funny. It was usually if they were imagining something happening. Yeah, you get loads of those. You get a flashback to when they first started. You get a dream sequence or a flash forward to when they're all mothers 
and absolutely hate their music and hate their children a little bit as well. <laughs> There's an alternate reality where Emma is in an Agatha Christie novel mm-hmm. and she gets away with being the killer because she has such a cute little smile. <laughs> There's Spice Force 5. It was Charlie's Angels but it was a mixture of any of those kind of espionage things because they used the music from Mission Impossible yeah. because they did all five of them had their own introduction and they used yeah. music from a different, you know, Charlie's Angels came last and mm. I think Mission Impossible's in there and there was a few of those other yeah. ones. So there's Wonder Woman yeah, and then yeah. Victoria is just Victoria. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of their own mothers, it was like a soap opera because yeah. it was like the Renee Standers and Carnation <laughs> Street, you mm-hmm. know, a mixture of the two of them. The style I mean, of room they're in as well. Uh-huh. It's very cramped. They're all in one living room and they've mm-hmm. got the clothes horse and things. Mm-hmm. It is quite working class, I'd say. Mm-hmm. It very much reminds me of what my house was like in like the early 90s. Uh-huh. They've yeah. got like the blinds down and they've got, oh, it's horrid where they've got the all the washing thing. above them uh-huh. so it makes the room even smaller. It's all mm-hmm. tiny Spice Girls clothes. Yes. <laughs> And then posh, it's sitting in the back of and I only see my kids once a month because they're <laughs> boarding school. They really build on the stereotypes and they actually have a discussion about their stereotypes. Yeah. At one point, man, so sporty isn't wanting to be on a treadmill or, or the exercise bike all the time and not always talking about football. Yeah. And of course, that's what she does. <laughs> Emma having a little tantrum about being baby spice. Yeah. Well, Emma's really violent throughout the film. Yeah, so yeah. Obviously, they get the dream sequence where she's the killer and mm-hmm. Hugh Laurie is Poirot and that. And then there's a point at the end of the film when they've gone full meta and she's asking the writer, I'd really like to hit somebody at some point. Mm-hmm. Can it be Victoria? That happens, isn't it? Yeah. In the baby delivery. Yeah. And Victoria goes, slap me! Because <laughs> she's panicking and Emma duly obliges, smacks her around the face. I actually thought there were times when the banter between them actually tipped over into being actually a bit mean. Yeah. They are actually a bit horrible, especially to Jerry. <laughs> Maybe that's why she left. <laughs> Tension. You know, I think there's a lot of tension there and I think it was coming through in the film yeah. already. When she gives her one liner, so she's like talking about in the uh-huh. rainforest or somewhere, the scene after that they'll always cut to Sporty Spice, they'll cut to Mel C and she'll just be rolling her eyes, mm-hmm. it's always her. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's because she's the only one that can roll her eyes or they're trying to say something. <laughs> yeah, but... if she's especially fed yeah. up with this. There was a whole discussion about star signs, yeah, that sort of thing. There was a sort of maybe anti-intellectualism going on there. Okay. Just because Jerry's the one who claims to have read stuff and yeah. she's telling them these facts. And then they're always a bit, you know, Mel C is the sporty one rolling her eyes. So it's <laughs> actually feeding into a stereotype of somebody who's working class, regional and into sports, being anti-intellectual oh, and right. Larry, you know. Mm. So I was wondering if there was something else going on there a bit yeah. too. Because I always see it like, um, I do think Jerry gets a bit of a hard go in this. I think there's certain hints in the way they'll... um. As I was saying with the books, the way they decorate what's around her, what she's doing or what she's saying and how she says it. Maybe it's to do with how she's always pushing the girl power thing. Because there's a point where when they all dress as each other, yeah. Mel B dresses as her and she says, blah, 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 girl power, feminism, you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. really... Um, Sort of derogatory. played down, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was fascinating, not that where they're all pretend to be each other. So there's that, and then Sporty Spice Mel C is playing posh Victoria. <laughs> she looks like a man in drag. <laughs> she looks really heavy set because she's wearing a tiny dress and massive heels, and she looks like she's stomping around with big man legs. I love drag queens, <laughs> but it looked like somebody who's usually coded in a masculine way, yeah. and it did look like that, like a masculinized posh spice as opposed to the very feminized mm-hmm. posh spice that you used to. I would say maybe Sporty's the one who gets to escape from her designated role the least because everything she says is to do with sports. Even yeah. when she's talking about giving birth, she's saying it's like passing a football. Mm. And when she sees the baby, they're all like, oh, it's so cute. And she's like, oh, I hope it supports my football team. Mm. <laughs> it's like they went through the script and they went, oh, she's got a line and it's not to do with football. Can we can we change this? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, we'll put something in. Liverpool. Blah, blah. When they go to Milan for like six hours and they're all talking to the dancers, she's giving him tips about how his football team can improve. Yeah, she's like, AC Milano, we can send a field. Exactly. <laughs> and when you see them all in their own respective homes, Jerry has a home, Baby has a home, Mel B has a home. And then she, it's like she lives in um, like the underground of Crystal Palace, like Phantom yeah. of the Opera. She's <laughs> just hugging a football. Yeah, she's hugging a football <laughs> and she's in like the changing ground where it's like painted cement. I know. <laughs> some sad little football gremlin. Bless her heart. Who else pretends to be who in that bit? Okay, so Baby Spice is Scary Spice. Yeah, she um, looked like she was having a bit of fun. Yeah. <laughs> and then Scary Spice is Ginger. Ginger is sporty. 
sporty is posh and posh is baby it was fascinating actually seeing them be each other yeah this is like a whole different level of performativity there where you can see mm-hmm. them being each other and kind of what they think about each other sort of comes out a little bit or what they think of the characters it does because you know right this is fiction mm. and it totally collapses fact and fiction because yeah. you know it's okay it's a real girl band and they really are these characters but they're playing a character of a character mm-hmm. that they're also behind as a real person yeah. so there's layers of fiction being painted on this and then it's a fictional film film about real stuff that could be happening but you get the sense that when they're insulting each other they a wee bit mean it and you think well it's not really that long before they actually do all break up and hate each other (laughs) but it's so intense as well the whole the film goes into that too the intensity of this level of stardom and how fast it's happened everybody wanting a piece of you I mean that bit where it's really silly you know when they have to stop the bus because the toilets are broken they all need to pee and they have to go to the woods and they <laughs> meet these aliens <laughs> from who of course streets. know who they are they know who they are it's the Spice Girls can um, we get tickets to your show it's sold out like <laughs> sorry but even that it's that and they're asking for autographs they're mm. asking for kisses mm. the sense of entitlement over parts of these women yeah and I think you see even before the kiss which they do ask for you see the alien go in and grab a yeah. boob and one of them says no handshake that was a bit touch and go for a second <laughs> I thought so yeah I just thought like there's you know consent but that kind of goes back to the whole tabloid thing because mm. right at the beginning after they meet Elton John they go out with Clifford and Clifford covers up a camera and he says something like no upskirt shot something like that is essentially mm-hmm. saying please don't take photos of these women's vaginas it's there in the background always even if it is quite a girl centred film for them being the main characters mm-hmm. there are men everywhere or male coded mm-hmm. aliens if you want and it's yeah. always an underlying threat which I mean it's more or less a kids film so it doesn't bubble up a great deal but mm-hmm. it's still there and you can pick up on it if you're watching it enough yeah I thought, I thought it was coming up a fair bit the sort of sense of entitlement over every piece of them you know and then you've got the tension between the outfits they're wearing was very revealing they're showing off a lot of their bodies and I suppose the content of their songs you know a lot of it's about female sexuality but it's also about like I don't want to be in a relationship with you I don't want to have sex with you I just want to be your friend kind of lyrics as well and a lot of their songs are about friendship and about well especially spice up your life that's about everybody have a good time yeah and let's be cool to each other it's not about that kind of thing it gets very wild stallions at the end a little it bit. does <laughs> yeah it does it is be excellent to each other kind of vibe at the end and of course it starts with too much mm-hmm. which is a song which is trying to tell a guy to back off because you're not really that into him and you just want to be mates so you get the sense of we do this for us because I was sort of thinking of, as well about the film it's sort of in the mood of post-feminism it's not something I know a huge amount about because I just feel like there's still such a need for feminism yeah. that we're not there mm-hmm. yet and post-feminism is this little bubble of very privileged women who didn't mm-hmm. have to think so much about this kind of thing where they were just like well we'll sure we're all equal now what's the harm it's just mm-hmm. boys being boys and actually there's a lot of harm and if you're not as privileged as some people it affects you more than mm-hmm. others so it's for me post-feminism is it's not really but I kind of always thought that they were a bit like that where it's just like girls are doing it for themselves and we can wear all these clothes and it doesn't have to be sexualized if mm-hmm. we don't want it to be we just like wearing these tiny dresses in a way it is quite camp and quite drag in that there's so much emphasis on the boobs but it's not for sexual purposes yeah. it's right these these glitzy clothes are being worn for the fun of that, mm. for the fun of looking outlandish, for the fun of expressing yourself, for the fun of just celebrating your body. I think maybe that's mm. where the negativity towards Jerry comes because her sort of thing is girl power. It's key that it's girl and it's not woman, so if the film's saying maybe what they're saying isn't great, but the situation they're put in still isn't right. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, blah 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 feminism you mean is pretty much post feminism. We're past the point where we need to fight for anything so let's just commodify it which is kind of what girl power is obviously this film came out 20 years ago but I was in Primark yesterday and I saw at least two things with girl power written on it yeah of course and they were probably made in a sweatshop somewhere yeah with young underage girls probably making those mm. things for basically no money yeah in very long hours if you look at oh, what's the character called Damien the photographer is that a, Richard O'Brien it's Richard O'Brien yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
when they're in the hospital and he bangs his head, yeah. it's the point where the Hollywood narrator's kind of taken over and he says, <laughs> oh, he just realised it's the error of his ways. Yeah. And then he goes on to out the nasty editor of the newspaper. Uh-huh. So it's not that the girls do anything to take on the editor directly, and it's not like they do anything to change the photographer's mind, but the photographer sort of realises the error of his ways through this random yeah. epiphany, and then goes on to use his skills as the worker to overthrow his boss, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it would be fascinating to know what the five of them saw now about stuff now that they're in their 40s and they've gone through so much they've gone through very adult things and they've had families or busted relationships and all of it under very public scrutiny yeah as well even post spice girls some of them have been better at staying out of the limelight Mm -hmm. than others with the likes of certain movements that have emerged in the past year mm-hmm. or so, the Me Too movement, more is coming to light, I think, more because those of us with certain privileges are listening to people a bit more, I think. The fact that it's Mel B who has the digs at Jerry's feminism, how does that sit with her today as a black woman mm-hmm. when it's black women are more adversely affected by racially focused sexism? So it would be interesting to know if there's any maturity or any more knowledge there or is that because they are now in a state of so much privilege from their fame and their wealth generated from this machine do they even have to think about that mm. yeah. I think um, the Me Too thing's probably a good thing to touch on because obviously the, the comeuppance at the end is that the editors it's a jacuzzi scandal is what mm. he's caught in and that's just so tame compared to what has actually gone on yeah. like even if you take Max Clifford when we watched that we thought it's a mix between him and Rupert Murdoch Max mm. Clifford is currently in prison obviously after the 90s a lot of stuff came out about what newspaper editors like Piers Morgan were doing in terms of things like hacking dead people's phones, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. things like that. If today, if somebody was caught in a jacuzzi with two consenting adult women, you'd be like, do you want to be president? Exactly. It's funny, we've been watching Old Red Dwarf Mm -hmm. and there was something similar. There's an episode where they accidentally go back in time and they're in Dallas in 1963 (laughs) on a certain date. (laughs) They mess things up a bit. They disrupt Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm -hmm. He doesn't kill Kennedy. Kennedy continues to be president and Kennedy is impeached for having affairs. (laughs) And you think... What world is this that <laughs> that happens? Because that's not happening mm-hmm. anymore. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what you have to do anymore to yeah. get impeached because it's kind of gone a bit beyond with Trump. So it's a similar thing where something that's not really scandalous anymore is yeah. huge to <laughs> There's other, of course, unfortunate bits because there's a Gary Glitter bit as well. There is, yes. So when they go to Milan, that was meant to feature a Gary Glitter cameo. Mm. But about a week before the film came out, it came out Boxing Day. It was like a big Christmas release. It came out that obviously he is a child molester. He's been convicted of that. He's currently in prison. Good. So they had to just sort of chop and change that from the film. But Mm. they have kept in the cover of his song, Do You Want to Be My Girl? I don't know how I feel about this because on one hand, I feel like once a cultural product of any kind is out there, it belongs to the public. I feel and so maybe there's a right to reclaim Mm. something but it just has such a sour taste because of the association with him I suppose it's one more of the many things that my childhood was filled with Jim will fix it and Mm. the Cosby show and all that sort of stuff and you're like (sighs) every time you see a name of a male celebrity lately and it is mostly male are they dead or what have they done are they dead or who have they sexually assaulted yeah and you're like, oh, right, it's a nice thing. Oh, yeah. that's good. I can continue <laughs> liking that person. Or if you hear the start of a headline that somebody's been accused or convicted of something, please don't let it be a long list of people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to look at the lists anymore <laughs> because I'm scared of who's going to be on them. Things like that mar a film like this beyond its control, really. Like, otherwise, they're fairly safe. I don't think anybody else in there. <laughs> no, I think they did alright, especially for the cameos. M- Michael Barrymore a little bit. Oh but... yes, yeah, I forgot about that. He's kind of like this drill sergeant who's supposed to be their dance, their choreographer. Yeah, he's like a dance instructor and they go to the creepy house in the countryside. Where it shifts the genre again, it becomes mm-hmm. like a kind of nighttime mystery thing and they're all creeping around the house. Well that always used to really scare me when it was little, like mm-hmm. the sounds. Like when he steps out of the toilet, it's such a... Oh, again. 
weird. Fuck that. A stupid scene. But every time he steps, it's really loud. It's like hyper diegetic. Uh. And they all wake up with every step. Like one of them wakes up from their fever dream about not wearing makeup. Okay, so in the film we've got, I would say, three types of media and three types of men who represent it. Okay. So we've got yeah, um, Piers, Cuthbert and Smythe, who is acted by Alan Cumming, who is Scots originally. I think he's from Perth and Kinross. And he puts on this sort of overcash British accent. And he's not particularly good at being any kind of documentarian. <laughs> but he's there. He sort of opens the film with his David Attenborough style introduction. Mm. And then we have the two Hollywood writers or directors, which is Norm from Cheers and Mark McKinney. And then we have the main baddie, who is the editor of a British tabloid newspaper. So do you think that Hollywood win in the film? Oh, that's an excellent observation. Yeah, because ultimately they crack it. They come up with all these crackpot ideas for films <laughs> and then they start describing the thing that's actually happening yeah. and you're actually enjoying it you're like yeah I could go with this this is a good movie Richard E. Grant's character Clifford he's going along with it he's getting really excited yeah. and they're waiting for them to burst through the door and they don't come he's like I hate those girls <laughs> then they burst through the door I love those girls he says yes to them so yeah I think it's a really excellent observation but the other ones lose out. The documentary just continues to fail. Yeah, I mean, if you put together all of the shots where you're seeing the point of view of the documentary's camera, mm -hmm. it's a terrible film. It's some kids swimming in the Thames. Yeah. <laughs> and then Richard E. Grant's going to hang himself. And then scenes where mm. they're trying to film the spy skills and they're talking over it. Mm -hmm. So he's like, get the posh one. And he's like, which one's the posh one? He's like, the one that looks posh. <laughs> like they're constantly moving the camera. I think the only time when they're successful in filming anything, the guy with the boom mic says, oh, I got a good splash there. And that's purely because the guy who's manning the documentary has fallen awesome. into the ocean. Mm -hmm. They can't capture the spy skills. They can only capture Piers mm -hmm. or Alan. Who he is. And of course the newspaper stuff falls through. So the tabloid media doesn't work out the documentary stuff doesn't work out but the fantastical <laughs> big money big Hollywood production I love that bit where they describe the bus having to go over London Bridge yeah. when it's racing they go oh it's going to be expensive and then you see it happening with little models yeah <laughs> little stop motion animation <laughs> that was really funny just like a toy yeah. somebody's flicked over it yeah it was just a little toy London bus London <laughs> Union flag bus <laughs> Going over. Yeah, I think you're onto something there. Hollywood wins the day. Mm -hmm. But do they? Well, continue with your investigation. My crackpot theory. Yeah, please do. I think, let me go back to my notes. The first time you meet um, those two characters, it's Mark McKinney and it's Norm from Cheers. They're pitching a film which is Sporty Spice is caring for an elderly relative. <laughs> now, the story is apparently the Spice Girls sort of concept of a movie was optioned by Disney. And oh. part of what they pitched was that the girls weren't going to be themselves. They were going to play characters. And one of these girls would be like a single mum. And one of them would be caring for like an elderly relative. Oh. But they do just go in with this stupid idea and when it's shot down, it's crocodiles. What about, it's like monkey tennis, you know, from Alan Partridge. Mm. And then there's the comment about Marilyn Monroe, yeah. which I think you sort of answered back to while it was on. <laughs> what was that? I can't remember. Did anybody care if Marilyn Monroe could act? They just oh. cared that she was in focus. Oh yeah, and I says, well, she was also smarter than she looked. Marilyn keeps coming back because in the next scene, the next scene where they're having dinner with Clifford, Mark McKinney's character is changed into a Marilyn Monroe t-shirt mm. and you just see her eyes hovering above and below the camera's line of vision so she's just kind of peeking out depending on how he's shot and then Jerry Halwell dresses as Marilyn Monroe when they do their photo shoot montage <laughs> about two minutes after they've had an in-depth discussion about how everything's about how you look these days yeah. and complaining about that they do this elaborate photo shoot mm -hmm. even the song at the end of the end credits mm -hmm. it's a lot of Hollywood culture yeah it's very referential it's kind of like Vogue by Madonna it's just sort of yeah, name the things name the thing it might have been called lady as a vamp but i'm not yeah. sure if i got the right That's one it. you're and, right <laughs> um, just because it was fascinating because it was full of all the references but mm. there was quite a bit of it about marilyn monroe mm. there's a bit where it was something like norma jean had a seven year itch yeah and... some like got hot to a fever pitch yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was infused with that but they were also talking about women of the 90s <laughs> in it so it's these I don't know is that the right word cross pollinations or there's this back and forth in history of iconic women so it's like a cultural link figures. between them and the yeah women of the past okay 
Yeah, because Marilyn Monroe, I mean, she was an incredibly intelligent woman, but it was all about the image, you know, and she built that image. She, with the help of a makeup artist, designed that image, because obviously she wasn't a natural blonde. They got the right shade of red for the lips, mm-hmm. they designed the eyes and the emphasis on things. It was really intricately designed to be the ultimate symbol of sexual, or the ultimate object of male sexual desire, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. along those lines. And she was a pin-up, she did start as a pin up and she actually did some topless stuff mm-hmm. like soft core mm-hmm. kind of porn stuff and she did playboy before she got famous didn't did, she there was yeah. like a big sort of lawsuit about that uh-huh. but then to make it big and her first ever film role and she plays a bimbo she had a very small part in betty davis it's the one about the uh aging actress Oh, something Eve? Yes, All About Eve. All About Eve. Yes, that's right. Your memory's better than <laughs> mine. All About Eve. Yeah, that If we was... work together, we can come last in a pub quiz. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Marilyn Monroe's first film role. She played this blonde bimbo, this young actress in this movie about an ageing actress who was being oysted out by mm-hmm. a younger actress. She perfected that role so well, she couldn't get back out of it again. Mm-hmm. She was trying really hard to set up her own production company she really wanted to do serious acting that was all she ever aspired to do she wanted to stop doing those bimbo roles and she just never got out of it and then of course she had a lot of problems with depression and stuff and she suffered greatly with endometriosis oh yeah a lot of people gave her that diva persona where she got this reputation of not turning up to set on time and doing whatever she wanted because she was this big star but actually she was in severe pain Mm. a lot of the time she's a really fascinating woman i think how her image is still used i find really fascinating and so anybody who taps into that because again these are five industry generated girl figures yeah and they're the types of girls that you might be we even have the discussion like there's no hint of crossovers yeah it could be two or three Mm -hmm. of these things sporty but i'm also interested in other things space but all she talks about is sport which of course is the joke in the film but exactly because I think all of the characters they dress up as they are all identifiable in terms of pop culture but we see Jackie O as well who's yes. also related to Kennedy That's... she's in that song too yeah. Victoria dresses as her so she's still keeping the posh thing going yes. I suppose and then they dress as Charlie's Angels and then um, oh Danny and Sandy again it's Sporty Spice that dresses like she's Danny's a girl yeah. yeah she's in male drag oh. yeah and pulls it off like yeah. she's quite sexy looks good with the quick yeah. I think so she looks really good on it <laughs> I loved it when <laughs> Victoria drives the bus. <laughs> she's in those heels with these immaculately pedicured <laughs> feet. You could see she probably spent hours upon them, like longer than she was filming. It could very well be that that's a body double, but I don't know though. Because <laughs> it would not surprise me if those really were her feet and she would have wanted her feet to be there for real. <laughs> But it could have been a foot model, who knows. <laughs> There's this like nuns on the run reference as well, the nuns in the mini. Yeah, so they stop in front of the uh, bus and that's what makes them tumble back into the bus when for some reason <laughs> they're on the roof. Yeah. Because those are the rules. I know. There's no way to get up there, but sure let's have them on the roof. <laughs> Elvis Costello behind the bar. Yeah. Hang on a second. And there's that pause where you think, are you, uh, are you Elvis Costello? That's what you expect the line to be. And it's just, can you please make that a double? Yeah. What's that they're talking about? They're talking about somebody who you become famous really quickly and then you're forgotten yeah. about. You go back to normal life. <laughs> Oh yes, there was the court thing. Stephen Fry is oh, the yeah. judge. That was another genre thing in one of the inserts. Mm-hmm. Their fantasy inserts. And that costume they're wearing in that scene is the same thing that they're wearing when they're discussing it. So it's kind of like a shared fantasy or a shared daydream. <laughs> and they talk about having the same dream. Yeah. Where they go to perform on stage but they have no head. Yeah. Because they're worried about not being able to sing. Mm-hmm. And then it's Victoria that says, <laughs> oh, I had the same dream but only I did of a head but it had no makeup on it <laughs> and they all say that that's worse yeah. I mean the abbot hole's quite big nobody's really going to be able to tell yeah but their makeup comes out of here <laughs> so yeah at the end the Hollywood story shows up as a narration so you hear Mark McKinney's character talking what's his name Graydon Grayson? oh yeah great Graydon something like that Graydon's narrating it and he'll say a line and they'll echo it in their dialogue so it is sort of like the film you're watching is the film he's pitching but that breaks down in that scene when he says they're going to slam through that door right there and <laughs> Clifford looks expectant and he's like, you lied to me and he proceeds to try and strangle him. So even the Hollywood treatment doesn't really make it. Yeah. They still kind of break out of that mould. And when he pitches the bomb, which 
we do, we see the bomb on the books. Yeah. Even George Wendt's character is like, no, they've been through enough. Yeah. <laughs> I've had enough of the rules. I've heard enough. Yeah. But it's a really nice callback because in the end credit sequence, where it's real life, yeah. inverted commas, and they're discussing the making of the film, and the girls sort of realise, oh, there's people watching us, yeah. and they're talking to you in the cinema, they break the fourth wall, and they say, oh, we know what you're thinking. You're wondering what happened to that bomb on the bus, <laughs> and then there's this off screen yeah. explosion. Really nice use of off screen space to continue the comedy. It's not just about what you do see, it's often about what you don't. So it's not like just dialogue. It's kind of a touch and go joke, but I quite enjoy it. It's Richard E. Grant, and he's sat and he's desolate, and he pulls out the noose from an off screen <sighs> space. <laughs> I just have that ready to go. Yeah. He's describing to the documentarians what he's going to do because yeah. it looks like they're not going to turn up to the Albert Hall. He says, we're going to get the band going, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and I'll come out from backstage, then I'll hang myself, <laughs> and he just lifts up the noose. And when he changes his mind, Alan Cummings' face, it just falls, and he's like, that would have been the perfect ending of yeah. my film. It's really dark, because he wants it to be really dramatic, and he's forcing it to be something it's not. Yeah. And again, you get the media doing that on a whole other thing, and they're trying to bring them down they're trying to make scandals yeah they are trying to sort of manipulate them and you're like no you can make so much more money if they're successful for longer mm-hmm. surely but then it's this mood of everything being about scandal there's a point at the beginning where Piers is talking about I want to see their very souls and the cameraman makes a joke where he's like we're going to need a much longer length yeah, for that because yeah. <laughs> you just had this discussion with the five of them during the rehearsal and they're all bantering with each other but being quite mean again yeah. <laughs> stuff about what they look like how they're dressed they're making fun of each other so you're just getting this superficial view of them at that point point. and again the balcony comes into it because it's a double decker bus <laughs> it's TARDIS like as you've said it's massive Clifford's office is above them so you can always look down and watch over mm. them a little bit and then a lot of piers of shots again are from balconies and then Nicola's always separated from them as well yeah it does vary which one of them's raised above but either way they're kept apart just for physical representation of the fact that fame's keeping them apart from being with their friend I was just thinking it's a noted down when in the opening credits Mm -hmm. it's their star names it's Emma it's Mel B Mel C yeah they say like Victoria Uh instead of like Posh Bice yeah, rather than give them full names in the credits, mm. so it's only in the end credits where you say it says the Spice Girls are and oh, it gives and you get the full names. names and it plays over a music video mm-hmm. and then cuts to them being on top of the pops. <laughs> Again, riddled with the same sort of problems. Yeah, because the likes of half the presenters yeah. were. Yeah, I'll say no more about these people. They don't need a platform. <laughs> Bill Patterson had a nice wee bit as Brian, the cafe owner. Oh. So what's um, he been in? One of the things that comes immediately to mind was he was in Shakespeare Retold's Midsummer Night's Dream. He's a really well-known Scottish actor. He's been in so much stuff, I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> he does loads of voiceover work as well. But that was a nice wee thing where they remember their origins and when they were broke and coming up with their very first single and that's yeah. how they get wannabe in there you know because that was the thing that yeah. really made it for them i'm assuming that's fictionalized as well i don't know a great deal about the story about how they got started but i'm assuming they would put together mm. in like a audition record label kind of way i don't think obviously mm. with them being from different parts of the country i don't think they would have been friends as teenagers and just started it organically i think they were manufactured and in this they've manufactured an organic story for them to tell i think they were pretty young when they all got together i think they were manufactured I mean I'm gonna sell this with absolutely the vaguest of memories and we all know how bad my memory is anyway <laughs> so I would just go and look into this yourselves if you're interested <laughs> but I do remember them saying stuff like they lived together they had a house together at one point but they were working towards making it in the music industry so I think you're right I think they had been put together and they were all living together and they were working towards this mm. but they were flat broke they were really struggling for a long time they were barely eating just constantly working towards this and then they got that single and they made mm. it big it became a phenomenon overnight mm. and everybody started dressing funny <laughs> well, I think people were doing that anyway I think they were <laughs> but I think we felt like we had license to do it after that <laughs> I think there was one point where Mel B during the rehearsals she was wearing these massive white combat trousers with bits of material hanging mm. off them we all had had those I had a black pair I wore them all the time it was never done getting those things caught in doors some things. of them are really dangerous because they'll connect the legs together through like random bits of fabric at the back. but you see it was a goth 
Well, it was like a metal thing to do yeah. as well, where you would chain your legs together, and it was sort of like a light version of that. But I used to wear really outlandishly baggy trousers, the way that you would have in quite a lot of the film. I was never done tripping over them. That's <laughs> so why I mostly wear skinny things and tapered things Overcompensating now. now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not comfortable in them, but I don't trip over half as much. <laughs> I've got the scars on my knees to prove it. Do you have anything else you would like to add or any more theories you want to explore? The main one certainly is the way the star machine works around them. Every time I watch it I try and focus on a different one. So it'll either be Alan Cummings' character or Kevin McMaxford's character. Because okay. I think even in just like the little edits between the scenes so much happens. Yeah. One of my favourite jokes is what if they find the cure for deja vu? Yeah. And then yeah, they yeah. repeat that scene. <laughs> He's like oh not me. What if they find the cure for deja vu? <laughs> oh not me. <laughs> boom boom. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Tip your waitress. <laughs> There's loads of moments I get really like, oh, that's so silly, but they do it so well. Because that's not played as if he's telling the joke. He's not a man who tells jokes. No, it's, it's just, the same clip, just sort of copied looped. and pasted. Uh-huh. It's not a joke for them, it's a joke for the audience. Yes. And it, again, it goes into how melodramatic his life is. And then when the Archbishop of Candleford shows up. Candleford, yeah. Yeah. And it was Richard Briers. Jerry makes a flippant comment, is the Pope a Catholic? <laughs> then, yeah, because um, it's during that, do you like boys? Do you have time yeah. for boys questions? He's like, is the Pope a Catholic? Yeah. Of course I like boys. <laughs> and then the newspaper headline is, um, Spice Girls question, authenticity of the Pope, something <laughs> like that. And then he's on some sort of representation of the church, is yeah. on TV saying, of course he's a Catholic. What yeah. evidence do the Spice Girls have? Yeah. And it's that media machine where he even controls the church in a way he can... Manipulates everything, there's yeah. tendrils everywhere. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. And then Damien the photographer questions his credentials and he goes here's a photo of you smelling your socks here's one of you picking your nose here's one of you making out with a girl when you were 12 years old <laughs> I'm a time travelling photographer and he's like this guy's brilliant <laughs> you have so much power as an editor of a magazine mm. in the late 90s that the only thing you'll be impressed by is a literal time lord with a Kodak or something uh, who happens to be Richard O'Brien yeah <laughs> <laughs> were you in Rocky Horror Picture Show? <laughs> you crystal maze <laughs> did you do the crystal maze <laughs> yeah. I noticed so because I like watching the credits because they're gold mines of information. So it was completed in 1997 and it was copyrighted to Five Girls Limited. Yeah. So they had their own production company yeah. for this. So there's nothing really much to say about it. I just thought that was notable. When they list all the songs at the end, they're always listed as having a writing credit as well. Yeah, it's the Spice Girls with mm-hmm. another songwriter. We've covered everything. We've covered the aliens. We've covered the music montage. I don't think you've ever really covered everything. There's always something <laughs> you could, something more profound you could mm. say that you've forgotten about. Uh, yeah, we've mentioned a pig. Oh, he's the star of the show. The star or of she's show. the star of the show, I don't know. It's the star of the show. Because it is, it's a playful movie, but I do think there is a lot to say about it and a lot uh-huh. to be seen in it. There's so much going on, there's so many genres that you can pick up on little things. Uh, yeah, it's film and popular culture literate. Yeah. I liked it for that because I, I enjoy things like mm-hmm. that anyway, so I love all the references because it shows that whoever put this together, even if the Spice Girls have much to do with that or not, mm-hmm. whoever put all of that together, knows their stuff. And then mm-hmm. they were still creating and um, curating something about the Spice Girls phenomena at the same time. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, they were there and they were acting in it, but somebody sort of sat there, put it all together, and it still sort of makes us laugh 20 years on. And it's aged all right. For, um... I think so. In years to come, there'll be young people coming across this, and it'll be a really good fun romp mm-hmm. for them. And it's fairly innocent. There's some stuff that's a bit... Mm... Yeah, I mean, it's PG, and yeah. I think that's certainly the right rating for it. Yeah, I yeah. wouldn't put it any higher. Yeah. yeah. And it's one of the things, if you don't know what they're on about, you won't know it, what they're on about. It'll go over your head. Yeah. It's just good fun. As you say, there's some other stuff you can get into. I mean, I think it'd be interesting, probably more from an academic point of view and a cultural studies point of view, be comparing it with the Beatles films, mm-hmm. Hard Day's Night and Help and things like that. And I can't speak to those because I haven't seen them. I have... A lot of people will probably think less of me or little of me, but I, I've <laughs> never been a Beatles fan. Mm-hmm. I am a Kinks girl, and that's <laughs> that. I've never really seen the fuss about the Beatles, but they either tapped into or they created, I don't know which, 
an energy yeah about them the mania that came out of them maybe for them it was a post-war thing as well where people were starting to relax a bit more and enjoy themselves and be okay with being involved in culture i don't know what it is about that phenomenon in the early 60s but there was a moment and they went for it yeah they're very much representing the teen coming out and being like teen with a capital t you know we've got money to spend Mm -hmm. we've got our own little identities and we're gonna do what we want (laughs) the hysteria about girl fandom and then this was a whole different kind of girl fandom yeah. with the Spice Girls. This was quite empowering. I remember, you know, in my high school they were doing talent shows and there were groups of girls who would you would get several groups of five girls getting together. <laughs> you have to argue about which girls. one you're going to be. <laughs> you would choose one of the five dress a bit like them and perform well usually mime to Mm. one of the songs and make a dance up or something see that's drag again though isn't it because their overemphasized femininity Uh you can play dress up exactly yeah because their costume has changed so much it's just the general style so if you're baby it's little short skirts and or dresses yeah just pigtails cutesy yeah. it's blonde pigtails and the big shoes or boots with socks you know just something that looks cute and not overly sexualized but still something between girly and womanly the sporty it's just football tops not really a lot of effort <laughs> I always felt sorry for her because she had the least elaborate costume <laughs> she looks really ordinary <laughs> playing next to the other four posh it's a fancy black dress yeah. and a pout straightened hair but Jerry and Mel B they're the fun ones they're mm. the ones you really go to town with you <laughs> do the big makeup the big hair the big boots and all the flesh on display and squeezing up the boobs <laughs> and brightest colours a leopard print I remember talent shows where some of the senior girls <laughs> would do he's definitely you know, and I would have to fight over which song we're going to do because we do the same song we, we all can't do wannabe okay <sighs> yeah. somebody's going to have to go and change I never really did wannabe I think it was more ones like um, Stop Britain no it wasn't that one it's the one with the video where they're in the desert what's that one I can't remember <laughs> I know which video you mean because one of the favourite tweets I've seen where it says Mad Max Fury Road and it's just a still from that film but I can't uh, remember which one yeah. it is <laughs> <laughs> that was very popular. You're just naming it. Like, is it Runaway? <laughs> You're like, nope, that's the cause. <laughs> is it Last Christmas? But like, no, it's George Michael. <laughs> oh, George. I miss him. But yeah, so it's interesting to revisit that, to think back to that time. But also, what does it mean now? Mm-hmm. So I'm quite interested in your fandom of it and what it means to you as a kid. And then not now, like all this time after. Because I do think it has aged well. I mean, obviously, they had a lot of issues with having to cut somebody out of it, like a week mm-hmm. before releasing it. They had to cut out references to Princess Diana, because she had died oh, during the Oh, gosh, right. And Gianni Versace as well. He was murdered by a serial killer. Mm-hmm. We had to edit him out of this. <laughs> Oh, what a shame. So they did come up against some um, unlucky scripting. I didn't realise those last ones. I know the princes went to the premiere. It was interesting, the very brief shot of Buckingham Palace, because I mm. think it's very rare that you're allowed to actually film Buckingham Palace. I mean, if you're a spy school, you can do anything. <laughs> That's it. And then it's such a London-centric. Yeah, I mean, at the end in the credits it said it was all filmed on location, either in London or in the studios in Twickenham. Even the bits in Milan must have been in the studio. Oh, yeah. That's something you could knock together on a studio sound stage. <laughs> no bother, really. Your second units would be the ones doing the planes driving there's no need for anybody else to be involved in that do you have anything else no not really apart from everybody should obviously watch the spice girls movie there's a lot to be said about it yeah Um, i think that's a good point actually if you've never given it a go i would recommend doing what i did before we started recording again you asked me what i think it's been 20 years you (laughs) haven't seen this film but i believe this very firmly that you see a film at the right time in your life because i wouldn't have been receptive to that when you were little go <laughs> when I was this like, isn't for me <laughs> that feels like a million years ago yeah I would have been totally resistant 
for that, too cool for that. Mm -hmm. Even a couple of years ago, probably had too much film snobbery Mm -hmm. to have thought that. But now I just feel like, no, it's really important to embrace stuff. I mean, obviously, yes, there's a lot of stuff I will never bother with. And I will think I'm not going to go there. But this, I don't know, I just think this captured a moment. I think it's a moment that has a very long echo. Yeah, that's fair. I think you definitely shouldn't write a film off because a lot of people enjoyed it and because a lot mm-hmm. of those people were young women <laughs> or girls. But that's the thing, isn't mm-hmm. it? Certainly in the past year, with Wonder Woman coming out, mm-hmm. so many people have been saying for years, oh, women shouldn't be directing films because who would want to go and see films made by and about women? That's just boring. And we can keep proving them wrong we keep breaking and making box office records people do want to see these things because we're more than half the population of this planet Mm -hmm. so of course we want our own stuff and it has been really interesting the past few months watching all of Sofia Coppola's films and thinking about girlhood on film but I suppose Mm. the thing with this is it's above the line and below the line so you're seeing these five girls and it says you know you have five girls production but obviously the director was male their manager Simon Fuller was they call him Svengali like and a lot of the Mm. writings about him he was very much the puppet master behind it all I think maybe a couple of weeks before the film came out or after they had broken with him and it's just the idea of maybe girl power is post-feminism and it didn't work Mm -hmm. and the only way they could really claim their freedom is to break up from being the Spice Girls Mm -hmm. because you can say oh it's like a girl power film but it's not really yeah all of the men in that film are representative of men in the real world Mm -hmm. some of them are just making their money and some of them are causing a lot more harm being honest about things like the Me Too movement a sort of childish reflection of that is in the film but it's reflecting what they experienced and what the people writing it were representing and they're very young at this point as well when you're young and it's happening you just think oh this this is just how it is this is just what happens and then you get older and you go oh I don't think that was okay actually I didn't consent to so much of what was happening to me you know even like that bit where Mel B gets groped a little bit by this alien mm-hmm. hand I mean it's not a real hand and it's not but it's still oh this isn't okay actually mm-hmm. and even the way the shots I think her head's not even fully in the frame yeah for the boob grab yeah uh-huh. there was something a bit distasteful about that mm-hmm. actually and especially watching it now some of this isn't quite okay a lot of them go off and try to get their independence and I think specifically about Jerry Halliwell and I think she has been married since doesn't she she's not Ooh. Jerry Halliwell anymore but she did have a bit of a solo career yeah. on the way to that she had this brutal exercise regime and she got really skinny and then the music videos she was doing for her solo stuff you know she had a cover of It's Raining Men those videos are about showing off that really overly skinny toned body that very very thin but muscular body this constructed sculpted tiny thing that she'd become and it was so nice seeing her in the film being voluptuous because even at the time I thought she was stunning her and Mel B together a pair of them were just these incredibly beautiful women I hated the way that the tabloids and media would call her the fat one. Oh. But you were too young to remember no, all of that. No, I mean, I know they do that with Little Mix now. Oh, do but, they? Yeah. I don't really know anything about them, but they do that yeah. on some mean and I bet she's a stick insect this year. <laughs> she's tiny. But they did that to Jerry Halliwell. I think that was partly why she went off and became so skinny. But I think they were all sort of like that. So I know definitely, um, obviously, Mel C's the sporty one. She has talked about in the past how she's experienced depression and eating disorders. Mm-hmm. So I think even if we're talking about things in terms of a time period, there was a point not where it was like fashion but it was kind of like an epidemic within cultural icons where sort of all of the women were very very thin it was all about their bodies and how they look and they couldn't just enjoy their bodies jokes in there about the meat and what they want and stuff but you know that's not true you see them with food on the table I don't think you see them eat which I mean obviously in film if you have to redo the scene redo scene you can be eating loads it's not comfortable factors to do it like a hundred times but just thinking about it I don't think no I don't think so and of course Victoria Beckham I remember every time she had another baby it was similar to what Kate Middleton gets now it's like she's only out of the hospital and she's already a size four again (laughs) you know it puts pressure on people trying to live their lives 
to have these perfect bodies. Is an Indian actress, Ashwarya Ray. Do you know she was Miss World in 1994? She's very beautiful. Oh. She was in Bride and Prejudice, and she was in King Arthur. She's done some things. Oh, okay. In UK at Anglophone Cinema, but she's very famous in India. When she had her baby, she was just regular, had been carrying a human for nine months, sort of size, and sort of Indian press were like, she's a gigantic elephant. Oh, it's not terrible. Mm. Everything so policed, and then these women end up with these eating disorders because mm. they can't keep up with the pressure of it. And their body is a commodity. Mm-hmm. When it's a girl group, it should be about their singing, <laughs> but it's never about the singing. This is really depressing. You should edit yes. this bit out. <laughs> I usually end up on a sour note. <laughs> is there anything cheery we can finish? What do you think the pig was called? Because we didn't see him oh, in, the, in the credit. We could name the pig Trilby McFraser. <laughs> I'll do you We're very jealous of your time with Roger Moore. <laughs> That was very special for you. (laughs) Well, thank you very much for this because I would not have watched this film otherwise and I'm really glad I've seen it and I think it was really cool to watch it with you as well, Christy. It's been really fun. (laughs) I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'll have to get you on another time. Yeah, we've got something a bit more serious. Well, something sillier. (laughs) (laughs) Something even sillier next time. That's the challenge. Many thanks again to Christy for giving up an afternoon to do this. If you find this fun, interesting or useful, please make a regular pledge to patreon.com to enable us to keep probing areas of audiovisual cultures. Funds are accruing to upgrade the website, which can be found at audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com. Thanks for listening, supporting and sharing. Catch you next time.